so coming back to the original question uh, posed by Shoman, is that uh, why uh, we talk about two different uh, sigma? So actually, when we talk about that, I am taking a mirrored image and looking into that particular reflection that we got and try to rotate it so that to see that whether it is superimposable or not. Over there, when you are taking the mirrored image, the mirrored plane is actually outside of the molecule. Okay, the, I didn't put that mirror plane inside the molecule. So that is why it doesn't really matter where I'm putting the mirror plane outside the molecule. Because over here, my goal is not to find whether the molecule itself it is reflecting. Because when you talk about a reflection plane, the reflection plane generally stays inside a molecule. And that is not the case over here. Over here, what we are doing, we are trying to get the mirror image, as simple as that. So it doesn't really matter where I'm putting the mirror plane. So anywhere you are trying to take the mirror image, that will be the same. However, when you're talking about an original improper axis of rotation SN, over there, what we say that we have to have a CN axis of rotation. That means there would be an axis of rotation which belongs in the belongs to the molecule. And there will be a sigma H plane that has to be inside the molecule. I cannot put that sigma plane outside the molecule because the symmetry elements has to belong inside the molecule. So that is the big difference we are talking about. So during the time when I'm trying to find out whether I am having a mirror image which is superimposable or not, I am taking the mirror image outside. So that means that is actually going to have a sigma plane. And now that mirror image will obviously going to match the uh, same result. If I take a sigma plane in any of the possible plane present inside the molecule, it has to be. So that is why now the change I can make it where I'm putting the CN axis. I have to put it just perpendicular to the sigma plane. And only then I can say I have a perfectly uh, ordered SN axis. So the big difference again, when we are talking about a sigma plane, sigma A, sigma B, sigma D, with respect to symmetry elements that has to be present inside the molecule, that has to go through the molecule. Whenever I am talking about a mirror image of a molecule, I am taking the mirror plane outside the molecule. That is the big difference. Does it answer your question, Soman? Yes, sir. Sir, are you writing something? No, I am not. Okay, so any more question? Sir, I have a question. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, sir, actually, uh, the molecule uh, content molecules is uh, of uh, D3 spine group, I know that, but I feel that the molecule means the four uh, oxygen atom is there that containing a plane. If we take that is a molecular plane, and then uh, I think that sigma H is present, I mean, I feel that it uh, it is sigma, it is the sigma H or not, means hmm. from the, sir, you okay. get my question. Yeah, I think you are talking about this uh, metal bound with three bidented ligand you are talking about? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, sir, oh. it is. you have shown in that like that, that uh, one oxygen is uh, up, upward to the plane and one is below to the plane. But generally when we are talking about, uh, when we uh, put in a, means when we try to draw the molecule in a plane, we just show that that four oxygen atom that is in the, uh, in a simple plane means it is a, in, uh, in it is a plane only. So in that way, if we found that, that, uh, that could be the sigma H because C3 is perpendicular and uh, and uh, it will reflect the upper oxygen to the lower oxygen. Uh, so is it possible that that plane is the sigma H? So if I understood your question, you want to say like this particular four oxygen containing plane, is it a sigma H or not? That is your question? Yeah, I feel that that is the molecular plane and sigma H also because uh, that is the perpendicular to the C3 axis also. Okay, so let's uh, take a uh, route on that and let's discuss this molecule. So now, first of all, first find it out whether it is a sigma plane or not. So let's do a sigma orientation over there. So first, all the oxygen as it is, we'll draw first. So these two oxygens, so I'm putting O1, O1, O2, O2, O3, O3 for my understanding. 
So O1, O1 will remain in the same plane. Fine. Then this O2 will remain in the same. This O3 is remaining in the same plane. What happens to this O2? If I'm doing a sigma orientation or sigma operation through this plane, this O2 will yes. go down. down. Okay, and the... this O3 will go up. So now you can see O2, O2 and O3, O3 have to connect. The oxygens are remaining, but the connectivity is different. Yes, and, sir. Yes. Okay. And that is why there is no sigma plane. Okay. Okay, sir. Thank okay. you. Okay. Any more question? Okay, so you might guys, you guys might have a lot of questions regarding the quiz, so don't worry about that. We'll have that at the end of the class, and this is a little bit different quiz than probably you have faced so far. Uh, it is not going to be uh, checking your, uh, I would say, like how much you actually probably studied too much about this particular course or how much you studied the last two classes. Not much on that, to be honest, and it is obviously not going to depend on how much you can remember. So there will be a few questions where it will ask you a question a little bit philosophical in nature, and that will require whatever we have gone through that class on that particular portion, how much we can use that particular knowledge to probe those answers. So don't worry about that too much. It is more of, for my understanding, like, if uh, you guys are following the points I want to deliver or not, and it has a minimal effect on your grades because I generally uh, over there will be uh, grading with respect to like whether you're following the correct thought process or not, and not really on that, uh, what is your actual answer? Okay, so it is not a binary kind of uh, mathematical question that if you have that answer, you get full marks. If you don't have the answer, you'll get zero, nothing like that. So the question will be a little bit, as I said, philosophical in nature. So you will put through your answers and then you will go through that. But anyways, we'll come into that a little bit later. So we'll proceed forward. And before that, over there, I want to write no sigma H plane present over there. And the other thing over here is that this plane over here, what you have drawn, and actually it is better to see if you actually draw the octahedral site probably better. So this is, I'm actually trying to draw the octahedral field, how it looks like. So it is called octahedral because there are eight hedra or faces. So C3 actually passes through here. Okay. And your sigma H plane that you are trying to tell or go, that is over here. So they are not really perpendicular to each other. Okay. And then that uh, what Soman was asking, what happens to the C2? Now C2 is over here. It may look like it is actually not in the perpendicular plane. That is because it is a line, not a plane. So now if I look into this particular angle, this angle is actually 90 degree. Okay, because it is actually a line like this. And on the top of that, I am putting my C2 over here. If I look through the C2 over here, so now you can see the C2 is sitting perpendicular to that, right? Because there are two lines. Because I'm looking in such a way, it may look like it is not. But if you look through the C2, you can find the C3 is lying like this. So this is the C3, this is the C2. So they are actually perpendicular. Okay. So Soman, give it another try. Don't always try to look into a molecule, try to visualize in your head. That is the best way you can see it. So generally, if you try to find out whether they're perpendicular or not, the best way to do that is put your visionary angle or visionary direction through one of the axis or through one of the plane. That is the best way to find out whether they are perpendicular or not. OK, so give it a try later. And if you still have issues, please let me know. OK, so. Okay, sir. Okay, thank you. So we'll go to the next portion. So, so far, what we have done in this particular class that we have gone through the molecular interaction, uh, sorry, molecular recognition that we have found out that that is actually has a big role to play. And we have discussed that molecular recognition system has a big role to play with the chirality. And that is why we are actually interested in chirality. And then we figure it out, biology. 
is actually a system which actually has a lot of chiral centers. OK, and those chiral centers are coming from the proteins, coming from the carbohydrates, and even from of the nucleic acids, RNAs and DNAs, all those things. And again, this chiral center doesn't always mean it has to uh, it have to have only a chirality present instead of the molecular uh, uh, level. That means that molecule with a carbon with four different groups, not always. It can have a secondary structure made out of a, like a polymer of a even an acadal molecule, but the secondary structure is such oriented that this molecule can be okay, chiral in nature. Okay, we'll come into that little uh, later, like alpha helical, beta sheet, all these structures of the protein and how they are chiral, even though the original molecules which are actually making it may not be chiral. For example, glycine. Glycine is not a chiral molecule, right? We actually have gone through the structures. And if you make it a polyglycine, and this polyglycine can make a alpha helical structure, and this alpha helical structure can be chiral. Whereas this glycine itself is achiral. So don't always look into what is the, uh, I would say that the backbone, or even say like the uh, primary units that is actually forming the polymers or the polymeric or the overall structure of a system instead in, in the terms of protein, carbohydrate or nucleic acids. It's not always to be the, bind us, the uh, forming units has to be chiral. The overall unit can be chiral. For an example, nucleic acids. The nucleic acids, the simple system, the nucleotides, they're not chiral. But when they make the RNA and DNA from the helical structure, they become chiral. Okay, so that we have learned. And then the other thing we learned, we learned what is an L amino acid. And we now learn how to draw L amino acid. And we actually learned all the 20 naturally occurring amino acids. And how they are actually drawn, what is their one letter and three letter code, and how they are actually defined over here. So that you have learned. Now the question comes in this particular fashion over here is that does this A amino acid and D amino acid really actually matters? And what is the effect of the presence of a L amino acid and D amino acid mixture in the system? So that we will discuss in details today. So the first question is if I look into biology, in biology you'll find L amino acids are the predominant ones. So if you find any amino acid in biology or it is coming from a biological origin, you'll find it is L in nature. And the L terms define that it is actually having a particular spatial orientation of the groups of the carboxylic acid group, of the R group, of the NH2 group. And they form in such a way that my amino acid structure. So when you draw these amino acids in such a way, the hydrogen goes at the back, carboxylic acid, the R group, which is also known as the side chain of an amino acid. And that is the most important part because the rest of them are actually very similar for all the amino acids. And they are actually makes generally the backbone of the system forming amide bonds. So this is formed in such a way that the if you connect the carboxylic acid group, R group, and NH2 group, they form a left hand rotation or anti clockwise rotation. So, this is known as the L amino acid. Whereas, if you take the opposite one, it puts the hydrogen over there. Now, you put R group over here, NH2 group over here. Now, you can see CORN goes to this side, and this is known as the D amino acid. So if you look into biology, most of them falls in this part. So their special orientation is in such a way that the carboxylic acid group, R group, and NH2 group form this left-hand orientation, which we already discussed as the corn rule. CO stands for the carboxylic acid, R is the side chain, N defines the amide groups. Now the question is why it is important. So for that, I'll give you some examples. 
And from those examples, we try to understand how important the presence of the D amino acid or the L amino acid are for the functions of the biological entities. So the first example I'll be giving is the following. We'll talk about the bacterial cell wall. So whatever the biology we all studied from our school, we know there are important feature in the bacteria, which is known as the cell wall, which stays on the outermost part of the bacteria, and it actually helps it to survive all the uh, toxic behavior, any other things coming towards this way, and helps us to survive. So cell wall is actually the very important protective layer for the bacteria. Now, we learn it all together, all these things in schools, but now as we are chemist and most of our in the PhD or in the master's level or higher standard of the bachelor's level, now we have a better idea like what this particular cell walls are made of. So if we look into carefully, we found the cell walls are made out of this very important factor called peptidoglycan. So if we divide it up, one side is peptide, one side is glycan. So peptide is nothing but peptides, that means protein. It is again forming between amide bonds or peptide bonds between different amino acids. So that is by its name. And the glycan defines carbohydrate molecule. We have discussed that a little bit earlier that what we have, we actually have a protein entity, a protein structure. And on the top of that, we actually have a carbohydrate motif, something like that. So these are the carbohydrates. And these are the proteins. And this full section will be called the peptidoglycan. And these are actually the building blocks of the bacterial cell wall. Now, the bacteria can have different effects on human life. Some of them are good, which are actually living in harmony with us. And some of them are bad, which actually try to get our metabolic uh, systems out of our way and use them for their own purpose. So those are actually not bad. And for that, what do we use? If I want to kill a bacteria, we use, in common term, antibacterial reagents. And how this antibacterial reagents in typically it works? Antibacterial reagents are nothing but chemicals, because now, as we are in a chemistry class, we try to look everything under the scanner of a chemist. So when you say a bacterial reagent, if you add the bacteria dies, that is what life science or biology says. And as a chemist, we try to understand, wait a minute, it dies, it's fine, but how it is actually working? What is the reaction is happening? So what we found, this anterior antibacterial reagents are nothing but something called protease or some chemicals that actually activate protease. What is protease? Protease is nothing but an enzyme that can cleave peptide bonds. And why it is critical? Because once you start cleaving the peptide bonds, you are going to create some fissions inside the wall. So you are going to breach the wall around the bacteria. And once you are starting breaching the wall, the protective layer around the bacteria will be gone. And once this protective layer is gone, now it is vulnerable. Now it is going to get attacked by all the different conditions. For an example, in our gastric juice, it is a very strong acidic region is present over there, which goes to even pH 2 to 3. If you put any protein over there, that is going to be just stewed up. However, the bacteria even survive over there. How? Because these peptidoglycans are actually putting a protective layer and 
fighting with it and make it survive. But the proteins present inside the bacteria, they might be, or even the nucleic acids present in the bacteria, they are vulnerable to this strong acidic condition. But the bacterial cell wall is actually protecting. But once this proteas come into the picture and start cleaving that proteins present in the cell wall, that is going to put a fissure. And through that, the acid or the protons can get into the system and kill the bacterial proteins that are important for their metabolism or the nucleic acid that are important for their survival. So that is how a protease work and that is how the antibacterial reagent generally works. Now, it is the survival of the fittest. So generally, these protease, when they're working, they actually work in such a way that they generally cleave a particular specific peptide bond. And depending on which particular peptide bond they like, they actually have different names. I'm not going into the details of that. So this protease, for example, one kind of protease is such that it likes, if there is an arginine, I will detect it. How they will detect it? If you remember, the arginine has a huge side chain, which contains a guanidine group. So they probably detect the guanidium ion and sits over there. And then whatever the peptide bond present just next to it, it just clips it. So that is how the protease actually detects the side chain, what is their functionality, and clip one of the peptide bonds. And that is how the protease work. Now, as we are just saying, the bacteria are not going to leave this war as it is. They are saying, okay, you have protease, I cannot defend myself very well against it because that is very strong reagent and a very strong, uh, actually it's an acid-based reagent, which actually can cleave my amide bond. The amide bond cleavage is nothing but an acid-based reaction. So how I can survive it? That is the thought process of the bacteria. So bacteria says like, okay, let's see how the protease is actually detecting the peptide bond. And as I just said, the protease, so for an example, this is my side chain of this peptidoglycan. So there is a huge peptidoglycan and I draw it such a way, but in reality, if I look closely, what we will find that is nothing but amide bonds next to each other. Right, CH, and there is this R group, and then there is this NH group, there is this carboxylic acid group, and so on and so forth. And say this R group is very critical for understanding or recognizing this protease when it is coming through. Say this is the protease it is coming through. So it is understanding this particular R group, detecting it, again, molecular recognition. And then it cleaves uh, this particular peptide bond. And that is how this protease works. So the bacteria thought like, okay, I cannot stop it because I have to make my bacterial wall in such a way that it has to have protein. I cannot get it without protein. But how can I change it without a huge amount of uh, different things, uh, in, uh, intuition of different things. So for example, you can totally change your, uh, the sequence of the peptides, that is possible. But for that, just imagine how much change you have to do into your gene. You have to totally put a totally new genetic material. You will end up putting up a new species. Yeah, that is a possibility that you evolve to a totally new species to survive. But that kind of evolution doesn't happen at a day. It requires millions years of evolution to reach there. So how the evolution start? Evolution typically starts with one point mutation. So it's just change one amino acid at a time or something like that. So biology can try that, but the issue is that when they're trying it, the problem is that they change one amino acid, but the protease can still work and bind a different portion of this system and cleave it. So what they want, 
leave everything as it is so that the protease still try to find this particular R group. But I want to change such subtle change that even in the presence of this R group, the protease will not be able to detect it. So how it actually done? So what the bacteria does, keep the R group same. Keep it an arginine group. But instead of L arginine, they change the whole system L to D amino acids. So now when you change that system to L to D amino acid, now you know enantiomers, their actual properties are not that different. And over here you can argue there are different uh, chiral centers are also present. So they're basically diastereomers, not the enantiomers, but for the sake of our discussion making it simple, we said if I change from one L to D amino acid, the overall property, overall structure is not going to change a huge amount. But a subtle change, the orientation of the R group will be subtly different. And such a small difference play a huge role because this protease, when it comes and try to detect it, it try to bind it, it has a particular binding pocket. The binding pocket already have a particular orientation present over there that can envelop that R group. However, as I go from L to D amino acid, it changes subtle way. It moves in so much little way, but it totally breaks down the interaction between the protease binding site and this R group when it is near to this peptide backbone. Because you have to stay near to the peptide backbone so that it can act. It is not only binding to that R group, but also staying close to this amide bonds because that you have to break. Now, when I change this R group from L to D, the inter, the inter, well, internuclear distance between the R and carbonyl group changes. And that actually shifts the whole scenario. Now the protease cannot bind the R and cleave the carbonyl group, uh, the amide bond together because that is not the binding pocket of the protease. So that is where you can still go under the radar without activating the protease. And that is what some of the bacteria actually does. They actually very smartly change only a few of the points L to D amino acid, and they understand which of the amino acids are close to my binding pocket of my protease and only those amino acids they actually change. And once they change it, what happens? They actually can goes uh, around the system without getting detected by the protease because protease has to first detect it through molecular recognition and only then can bind and cleave it. And the bacteria are smart enough to change from L to D without changing the overall structure a lot and get undetected. And that is how it actually works. And what it is found that it is reality that some of the D amino acid inclusion actually increases what is called the virulence, or I would generally particularly say the stability of the cell wall, bacterial cell wall, even in the presence of the protease. So that is how a D amino acid, L amino acid mixture is actually very important. And it is find out that when the bacteria are trying to do that, they generally try to put only those amino acids which are generally a part of this molecular recognition program. So it can disrupt the molecular recognition pattern and get undetected. Okay. So at the end of the day, I will share you some reading materials that you can read more in details and try to get some more ideas, more information about this system. So over here, I'm giving you the overview how it actually works. Now there are multiple examples of it. I am not going to go through each and every example, but I'm just going to give you how it is actually work over there. So that is one of the system, how it actually works.